Lord, may your word go forth today. May you guide my words. May your spirit take these words and use them for good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing we need to say uh, when we talk about a passage like this is that followers of Jesus will face trials. Taylor already mentioned that. All kinds of trials. In all kinds of different ways. Sickness, persecution, spiritual warfare, disappointment, the suffering of loved ones, many, many different ways in which trials come into our lives. I pastored a church in West Haven, Connecticut, and there was a large church in our town that was a health and wealth church. A lot of people, a lot of excitement coming in the front door. But sadly, persistently coming out the back door were people who were disillusioned. Why? Because they faced the trials. And no matter how much they trusted in God, those trials remained. And so they either turned away from God and turned away from the faith, or they turned inward on themselves and they thought, what's wrong with me? To the contrary, we know from Scripture that we, like Christ, like the apostles, like the prophets, will encounter trials of various kinds. Even in the book, the book of James, we see reference to the prophets who endure trials. Abraham who endured trials, and perhaps the one most who's lifted up as that model of enduring trials, the person of Job. We are not in poor company when we endure trials. But what is this about considerate all joy? As we look at the text, it may seem that this is either some kind of sadism, uh, it hurts, please give me some more, or a form of kind of naivete, uh, we're going to cruise through life above trials, or maybe even that hypocritical, smiling face kind of Christian that always just says, yes, everything's fine, everything is good. But actually, Christian joy is not that kind of happiness. Christian joy is not a an emotion that comes and goes based on our comfort level. Quite to the contrary, Christian joy is a deep gladness that comes from God and comes because we see our lives from God's perspective. Amen. And that's really what this passage is about. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when every <coughs> face trials of many kinds, because you know. God's word and his promises are the reason we can have joy in the midst of the trials. And so today, what I'd like us to do is just look at three things that we need to remember, that we need to know from God's word as we face trials. And with his help, we can find joy even in the midst of the most difficult of them. The first one is that trials are opportunities to prove and to strengthen our faith. You know, faith is not simply an affirmation. I use the the example oftentimes of faith is not like believing in Saturn. Uh, we believe in Saturn, but it really has nothing to do with our lives. Faith is more like pressing on a brake pedal going down the tollway at 70 miles an hour. It's exerting trust in something. It's taking an action that trusts our very lives into the hands of something, and in this case, God. See, faith is not simply an affirmation. It is trust in God's word. It's trust in God's faithfulness. It's trust in his provision and in his grace in our lives. And oftentimes when God calls us to step out in obedience, what he is in fact calling us to do is to trust him in that act of obedience. That's why James is so intent upon linking the two together. I will show you my faith by my word. Because trusting in God means we obey God and step out in obedience to Him. The word proving or testing doesn't have a kind of adversarial role as much as an opportunity to strengthen and to prove the legitimacy of faith. Peter compares it to the purification of gold. You know, gold in the ancient world had all kinds of junk wrapped up into it and you put it into the fire. And the good stuff would go a certain place, and the bad stuff would go a different place, and that gold would be purified. And so 
Peter talks about this. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see, I think our faith is often weak, and our faith is often polluted by a lot of sinful things that we all have in our lives. <coughs> Self-sufficiency, false security, a sense of being uh, in control of our lives. And then along comes a trial and upsets all that. I remember when I was a seminary student, my wife and I were living in a suburb of Philadelphia, and uh, we finally found out that we were going to be expecting our first child. We were excited. A few weeks went along, I think a month went along, and it turned out uh, she was bigger than we thought she should be. And then there was some question about whether perhaps there were twins in there. So we went to go get an ultrasound. And this is a while ago. This is when ultrasounds were not routine. Uh, but we were still very excited. Why? Because we got to see this child or children uh, inside of my wife and rejoice about it. So we went to the ultrasound with great uh, nervousness and great joy in our hearts, the opportunity to see our child. And you know, we got all set up and we finally saw a little person moving, kicking. And then in the midst of kind of joy and, and, and all kind of little banter as we talked about that, all of a sudden the technician got quiet. And she said, excuse me, I need to go talk to the doctor left. And there we were. She came for a few minutes. She came back into the room and said, please get dressed. The doctor wants to talk to you. So we got dressed. We didn't know what was happening. We went into the office and the doctor there proceeded to tell us that this was hydramnios. This was something that children with Down syndrome often have. We should report the baby. We were really we, by God's grace, we just knew enough to say, we're not going to abort this baby, and we left the office. And we went out to the car, and we sat for an hour or two, and we just cried. We were disappointed. We were afraid. We had no idea what was ahead for us, how we could take care of a child with Down syndrome what kind of sorrow that might bring in our lives. The doctor was saying to us, she won't even know you. You should put her, you'd have to put her in an institution anyway. And we were just undone. We just didn't know what to do. And I'm sure that you have all, many of you have had those kinds of experiences where you, you feel like you're just undone and you get to the end of your rope and you don't know what to do. And it's at those points that you have a choice. You either become angry and bitter and turn away from God, or you hang on. And you turn to the Lord and you say, Lord, you are sufficient. Please, Lord, help us. We need you. You see, it's in those kind of moments where our self-sufficiency, our arrogance, our all the other things fade away, and we have the opportunity to cling, to trust in the only one who can help us. But you see, the blessing of that is that the one who clings to God in faith is the one who finds God faithful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And the one who doesn't have that opportunity always just wonders. I think God is faithful, in theory, but the one who goes through trials and turns to God and depends upon Him has a wonderful blessing in their lives, and that is that God is been faithful. And I can tell you the whole story about how God has been faithful in our family. And the story of many of you, the three spaces I see, who have been through trials, hard trials, difficult trials, the death of spouses, the disease of children, cancer, dementia, so many different things. And yet out of that kind of trusting in God comes the assurance that God is faithful. He is more than worthy of any trust we give him. 
And I think that's what James is getting at. You know, Tozer said it this way, God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. And that's part of what James is getting at. Consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, when you ever face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know, trusting in God will never disappoint us because God's grace, as Paul says, is more than sufficient for us. In our weakness, his power and his strength is perfected. An opportunity to test our faith. Secondly, faith in God's promises provides us with a kingdom perspective, the only perspective that allows us to see our lives in light of what God is doing. Trials can come and they can come and last a long time and it requires perseverance for us. Remember Hebrews chapter 11, that long list of people who, who exerted faith and trust in God? The general overarching theme there is that they did not see the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And so it is only with us in the New Testament period in Christ and the coming of the kingdom of God that they fully will realize God's promises to them. And so faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Trials really ask us the question, what is the perspective of your life? Is here and now all there is? Or is your life just part of something that is bigger? And the answer for those who believe the scriptures and believe the message of the kingdom is that our lives are part of something bigger. And that all of us, all of it is framed by where we are going and the promises that God has made to us. Think about what Jesus says. And you know, of course, James is picking up on wisdom literature as well. And so is Jesus, as he is the sage in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice! Yes, sir. And be glad! Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. You see, there's a perspective on our sufferings that makes no sense whatsoever unless the kingdom is coming. It makes no sense whatsoever unless Jesus is returning and establishing his kingdom and the blessedness moves forth into reality. Blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, sometimes I think that in our comforts, we can lose our passion, our love, our longing for the coming of Jesus. Why? Well, because it's not so bad. And yet, when you look down through church history, when you see, even now, places in different parts of the world where people are persecuted or going under trials, what is the cry that rings out all the time? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. The coming of Jesus Christ is palpable because it is the only thing that makes sense in the midst of trials and persecution. And it is the reward, the glory for that. In Revelation 21, it says that when he comes, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And so those who have lost loved ones in Christ will see them again. Those who have children who are disabled, who are unable to do certain things, will see their children made whole again. Those who have spouses who are struck with dementia or other inabilities will be able to talk again and speak again and commune again together and fellowship again. What? Well, how? When Christ comes and establishes his kingdom. Those who are suffering abuse, those who are under injustice will find vindication and freedom when Christ comes again. You see, our trials for Christians needs to take on this perspective. It is the eschatological perspective of what it means to go through trials. That's why James says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because that's the Lord's, come, because the Lord's coming. 
Now, I love the way Peter puts it, uh, Paul puts it, sorry, when he, when he says, look, all of these sufferings that we're going through now are like light and momentary troubles. Now, that's not meant to make light of the suffering that we're enduring. What it's meant to do is to show the magnitude of the glory that awaits us as believers. To show the, the length and the eternity and the depth of the, the glory that awaits us in Christ. And you know what? You can't even compare. It's not even on the same scale. The needle doesn't even move when you compare these current sufferings that we have with the glory that is in store for us. A lot of you have kids. I've, I've had kids and they've grown up. Uh, and whenever you're going on vacation, there's kind of a, an excitement about it. You know? uh, and even now, as my kids are older, you know, there is a kind of you know, thrill that we're going to the beach, or we're going to the Caribbean, or we're going on vacation, or something like that. And no matter what happens, you find out that people that wouldn't get up before 11 o'clock a.m. now can get up at 4.30 <laughs> to catch a flight, <laughs> right? And we're all there at 4 o'clock, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning in the dark, having a great time. Why are we having a great time? Because we know where we're going. Right? We can go to the airport and get through security and, you know, have all our stuff taken off and taken off again and everything else. But it's okay. Why? Because we know where we're going. We're going to the beach. We're going to the Caribbean. My friends, I think that is exactly the kind of joy we can have. We know we are going. And it is glorious. And that gives us the perspective that we need. Third, trials are God's tool, God's way of transforming us into the likeness of His Son. And that transformation isn't easy. It isn't always easy. You see, the text talks about the idea that perseverance, that we ought to let perseverance finish its work. There's a, there's a, a process that's going on here. There's a construction and a reconstruction and a demolition that's going on in our lives as we go through trials. That's why they're so difficult for us. They undo us in different ways. But they don't undo us just to leave us undone. They undo us to make us more like Jesus Christ. That God might rebuild us. And so we're commanded not only to consider it pure joy, but to let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That word is kleos, the, the perfection that the kingdom of God anticipates. Now that's not a kind of legalism. That is a kind of the, the goal of what Christ-likeness looks like. Not having any imperfection, not having any immaturity, not having any lack, there is completeness and wholeness that is envisioned in those who follow Christ. And so through trials, God develops our character and our hope. A very similar passage is found in Romans 5. We boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. God is at work constructing something in our lives in the midst of our trials. And through trials, God makes us more like Christ. 1 Peter 4, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. See, trials are a normal part of Christian life. Don't think them be strange. But rejoice. There's that word again. Insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Remember I had the opportunity to minister in Singapore and interface with a lot of different students from all over Asia. And I remember a number of students uh, in, in my class, uh, they obviously had physical issues. One student I had, it, you could tell that his head had, it was almost concave. Part of his forehead was actually bent in. Another one of my students had a lot of trouble walking. And I got to know them over time and, you know, began to inquire, get to know them. And I said, what happened to your head? And my brother from China ended up telling me what happened to his head. He got it from a beating in prison. 
for being a Christian. The other brother was a brother from Myanmar who wrecked his knees because he was walking up and over mountains in Myanmar to get to the villages that he passed with, the many villages that he passed with. But neither of these brothers had this kind of bitterness in their soul. Matter of fact, quite the contrary, when you got to know them, you realized that they considered this almost a badge of solidarity with Jesus, sharing in his suffering. And it gave them, it gave them great joy that they would be considered worthy to serve the master. And I went to teach them, and I had things that God had taught me that I could teach them, but I very quickly found out they had much to teach me. Because they were brothers of death. They were brothers of faith. They knew what it was like to suffer in solidarity with Jesus. And I would never wish their suffering on anybody, but I sure would long for their maturity and for their sense of solidarity with Christ and for their reward in heaven. All of that gave them a perspective, a perspective that God was at work in their lives. When we have trials, they are an opportunity for us to strengthen our dependence and our trust in God. And those who have a, that kind of faith will never be disappointed. It is a blessing. It is a blessing to depend less on that which is undependable and to depend more on him who is the man. That is a joy. It is also a joy to have our lives remind us that none of it makes sense as Christians except for the coming of Christ and the coming of his kingdom. And in our hearts, to seek first that kingdom and his righteousness and to say, come Lord. And finally, it is a joy, even in the midst of trials, for us to remember that God is at work. God is not a God who will leave us as we are. He will bring us through trials so that we can be deconstructed and be constructed in the image of Christ. Now, I don't know what challenges you are going through, but I know there are many here or going through serious trials, pain, suffering, disease, loved ones. I remember one of our friends who had a small child die. And I remember the, the mother's uh, words to me. She said, you know, heaven is real now. May our faith and trust in God make his coming kingdom real for us. So that we know, even in the midst of trials, that God is at work. Let's pray. Father, I pray particularly for those who are burdened, who are facing trials where they feel they cannot deal with it. Lord, may you invite them and may they reach out to find you faithful. May they be reminded again of your eternal love. Lord, may we encourage one another, knowing these things, that we might consider it all joy.